Good afternoon, and welcome back to another rendition of the Be Nature Virtual Event Space. You are tuned in to part two of Photograph Your Products Like a Boss. Natalie and Napoleon joining us. Part two of a two, three, two, three, three part series. Don't want to cut you short there. Uh, if you guys did not tune in for part one, don't worry. We're going to drop the link in the comments section and the chat if you're joining us here on Zoom so that you guys can catch up on that. But Natalie, welcome. Good to have you back. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, we are excited to have you and we are excited to get those questions in. So if you guys are joining us from Facebook, live stream, Vimeo, or our friends over there on YouTube, feel free to drop any questions you have into the comment section. Uh, I will say this. If you did not tune in, really, 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 really go back, tune in to the first one. I can't say it enough because talked about phone photography. Um, you know, Natalie, I, I told you this before we went live today. Not enough people focus on what's easy and what you anybody can do. I think shooting product photos on your phone was a direction I didn't anticipate. I know a lot of our viewers were didn't expect that. So I like that little directional twist there. Today, we're talking about it's all about that light. Of course, it always is all about the light. So I'm going to kick it over to Natalie, but make sure you get those questions in. And if you're joining us on YouTube, let us know where in the world you're joining us from. I think it's always so cool with such a large audience to see where in the world our viewers are watching from. So Natalie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Derek. I'm so happy to be back for part two of the three-part series. As Derek said, it's all about that light today. So I want to talk about the different types of light. Now, as Derek said, we are focusing on phone photography. I'm shooting with an iPhone today, but if you have an Android, the same uh, methods apply. If you have any questions, regardless of whether you're on an iPhone or an Android, drop your questions. Derek will ask me. It's all right to interrupt me. I'm happy to answer the questions as we're going along, since we will be looking at a scene and photographing it as we're going through the, the session. First, I'm going to talk about the three primary types of light. The first type of light is natural light. That's the light that we have coming in through the windows or if you're shooting outside, the sunlight. That can also be moonlight if you're shooting outside in the evening and you have some light coming down off of the moon. Now, that's a little bit tricky when you're photographing your products indoors. So today here on the East Coast, it's about 5 p.m. and Normally, I have a really beautiful light coming into my studio at 5 p.m. However, it is slightly overcast and it's threatening to storm any minute now. So hopefully it does so that you can see the difference between the light now and what the light looks like once it gets dark and overcast and stormy. And a lot of people struggle with that because oftentimes they'll look out an entire day or an afternoon or mid-morning to mid-afternoon to photograph their products using natural light. And what happens is that each time of the day, has a different type of light or a different color temperature to the light. We'll talk more about color temperature a little bit later, but I just wanna point that out now. So a lot of people will message me and tell me that they're struggling because their pictures look different from 10 o'clock in the morning until three o'clock in the afternoon, for example. The second type of light is ambient light. Ambient light is the light that exists in the room right now. Now that also includes the natural light that's coming through the windows and it also includes these horrendous, which you probably can't see right now, but I have these horrendous halogen overhead lights. Uh, some of them are yellow, some of them are blue, so they're really not quite sure what color temperature they should be. Uh, so they tend to cast a really ugly color onto the products. The third type of light is artificial light. And there's two types of artificial light. There's continuous light, which is primarily used for video. And then there's strobes, which, is, which are used with photography. Since we're talking about phone photography today, we're not going to be talking about strobe, but I will show you my strobes and I'll show you how it works so that if you are shooting products with a DSLR, you can just get a little bit of a, an idea of how you can do that. What I wanna do is I wanna get into the studio and I wanna play around with each of these different types of light so that you can see what they are, see how the light behaves, understand how the light behaves, understand what color temperature is so that you have the tools to make the proper decisions when you're having issues when you're actually shooting. So the first type of light I wanna work with is the natural light, since we still have a little bit of natural light outside before the storms come, although I'm not sure that they're gonna come or not, but I'm hoping, fingers crossed. 
let me share my screen and then we can get into the phone so you can see exactly what I can see here. All right, so I'm gonna share my phone and it takes a second. And it's got a little bit of stage fright here. All right, let's try this again. All right. All right, there we go. The first thing I want to do is now I'm on a, an iPhone and I'm on an iPhone uh, 13 Pro Max. If you have an older iPhone and you're not seeing the same settings that I'm seeing, update your operating system and you'll see most of the same settings that I'm using right now. If you're on an Android, your platform will be a little bit different. Your interface will be a little different. So drop your questions and we can help you sort those out. I'm gonna to go to the settings and I'm gonna scroll down to display and brightness. Then I'm gonna scroll down to auto lock and I'm gonna turn on never. This is so that when I'm shooting and I walk away from my phone, uh, and just so you know, oftentimes I'll call my phone my camera. For today's purposes, I am talking about my phone specifically, but if you hear the word camera, I mean my phone. Uh, so there's times where I walk away from my phone and I have my hands full and then the screen will shut off. So if you put the auto lock on never, your phone will stay on continuously. However, you want to make sure that you have a uh, charger, a cord, so you can plug your phone in because when you're on never, then your battery will die a lot faster. I'm going to slide my phone into my tripod here so we can look at, it, at the scene. I'm using here um, just a regular tripod, and then I also have a Joby arm um, that I have the phone attached to, which I picked up at BH. All right, so I also have, I'm going to be talking about some of the methods that I use when photographing these products so that you can use them in your process as well. I have a little um, rolly chair here. So when I'm photographing products that are a little bit lower, I can just roll around. I have different parts with different props and different tools. So everything is right here at my fingertips. If I can quickly grab it as I need it, I don't have to stop the shoot, walk away, get distracted uh, and, and fall out of the mood really. All right, so before we get started, because we're working with daylight with natural light, I'm going to turn all of the ambient lighting off, which means I'm turning my overheads off and I'm also turning my video lights off. So it'll be a little dark for a second. Also, I have two rooms here in my studio. My front room has a gigantic picture window, which does allow light to come into the room. So I'm just going to close the door between the two rooms so that we're strictly working with the light that is coming in through these windows now. Now you can see here that we have some shadows on the background, but it's not too bad. Um, and those can be desirable depending on what your story, what you've storyboarded for your particular product. Um, but today I just want to talk about the types of shadows, how to eliminate them if you want to eliminate them, and how to control daylight. Now, right now I have blinds on the windows. These blinds are serving as what is called a modifier. Anything that you put on a light, be it light coming in through a window or um, a continuous light, uh, light head or a strobe is called a modifier. So let's take a picture right now with the shades the way that they are with the blinds open slightly and i'm going to line everything up and make use the grid here on my screen to make sure that my proportions are correct you can go into either like mobile or the native um, camera roll on your iphone and edit those proportions but i like to solve everything in camera or in phone as much as I possibly can, because that's going to give me the most realistic image. It's also going to eliminate 
post-production time. If you're not a photographer and you're an indie retailer, then that time is really important for you to work on your business. I also, as I'm framing this shot, want to draw attention to the fact that I have a little bit of extra space up here on the top. That's okay. Uh, always shoot a little extra around your scene. This will give you the flexibility to come in and crop this scene later. So if I decide that I want to post this picture on Instagram, it'll be easy enough for me to crop it into a square because I've left that extra space. I also want to point out that nothing looks the same way through the lens as it does to the naked eye. So you can see here, I have this faucet. Now this is just a, a sink, a pedestal sink and a faucet. The pedestal sink I picked up on Facebook Marketplace. Um, so look, on, look at places like that for your props when you're planning your different shoots. And then I just picked up a faucet at a home improvement store, but you can see it looks in the, in the camera, it looks like it's angling away slightly. I'm just gonna angle it towards the windows so that it looks more realistic through the camera. I also just want to bring this, this glass jar forward a little bit so we can take a look at it. Now it looks like we're a little out of proportion. The bottom looks slightly bigger than the top. So I'm just going to lift my camera. I'm going to drop the tripod down. Now I'm not going to get super specific with proportions because today's session is mostly about the light, but we still want it to look pretty. All right, and I picked this glass bottle because you can see that it is reflective and you can see it looks like I can see the windows reflecting in it and then right here is my computer screen. If you're ever unsure what's reflecting in the bottle then or in your product, then all you have to do is zoom in slightly and take the time to decide what that is so you know what it is and how to eliminate it. All right, now I think that looks great. Okay, so this is the light coming in through the blinds. I'm gonna put my finger on the label and I'm gonna hold my finger on the label. You can see that yellow box, pulsate, and then lock. That's the auto exposure, auto focus lock. What that means is that it's locking the exposure in and it's also locking the focus in. If I want to change the exposure in the phone, all I have to do is slide my finger up and you can see how I'm brightening it, or I can slide my finger down and then I'm darkening the scene. So I'm just gonna slide my finger up slightly here. Uh, it tends to look a little bit darker on the zoom screen than it does in my phone here. Um, so I'm just gonna check and see how it looks to you. So now you can see these shadows here on the background, right? So let's. Again, I'm going to hold my finger. I'm just going to adjust the exposure slightly. Sometimes that happens. I'll click on the perspective instead. All right, so let's take this picture so that we can compare. So now you see the phone thinks that it's evening because it's so dark. And that's why it took a few seconds for the exposure to happen. That's why if you're photographing in a dark room like this right now, where you just have minimal light coming in through the window, it's integral that you have a tripod so that it's holding steady and you're not getting a blurred photograph, which then translates into a bad photograph. All right, now, next thing I wanna show you is what it looks like when I open the blinds all the way. So keep an eye on the background. I'm going to open lines so we still see a little bit of a shadow there and if i were shooting that with a uh, client or for myself it would take some time to really find out where the shadow is coming from um, it could even be coming from one of the lights i have here in the background typically when i'm shooting in my studio like this i'm shooting a product i clear everything out of the room because everything will create reflections, especially on a glass jar like this. So you can see now that I opened the windows, it's a lot brighter. Uh, what has happened is that it's diffused the light a little bit, so it's made a softer light. When I had the blinds down and the light was coming through, it was more of a directional light, and it was coming in specifically through the slats. 
which made everything look a little bit darker. Whenever you put any type of a diffuser on top of your light source, you're going to end up you're going to end up making the light a little bit darker. So again, let's hold our finger down on the label and then increase the exposure slightly and take that picture. All right, let's put the blinds back down. And now I want to turn on these not so lovely overhead lights. You can see as soon as I turn the lights on, the exposure has changed on the phone and it's extremely over the phone. The way that we're going to fix that is by putting our finger on the label, telling the phone that we want the phone to expose for the area that we're holding our finger on, which means we're telling the phone, hey phone, we want you to create an exposure that is perfect for this particular color. So it's really taking an evaluation of everything that's happening in the scene, but then focusing on this darker area. And that's why it's making the scene look a little bit darker. Now you can see the overhead lights have flattened the light out a little bit. We don't see those shadows on the backdrop that we saw when we were only working with natural light. Let's put our finger on the label, focus on the label and then increase exposure just slightly here and take the picture. I tend to shoot everything a little bit darker than what I want it to look like um, in the end as the final product because I have more information in the image than I do when I overexpose. So if I'm shooting something particularly light colored like the, the porcelain on this sink, for example, if I overexpose or open it up too much, give it too much light, then what happens is that I'm losing all of the information in the light areas. So when I'm in post-production and I'm trying to bring some detail back in those light areas, there just isn't any detail in the file. So shooting a little bit darker leaves the information in the file and gives me the opportunity to pull those areas uh, back out if I need to later on. Now you can see I had the reflection of the overhead lights in the bottle itself. So if you only have overhead lights or natural lights, a couple of ways to eliminate those glares is to grab some white pieces of white foam cord. Now you can see how important it is to have the phone on a tripod when you're shooting something like this because your hands are going to be occupied holding the Matt board. Also, I want to point out that this is a good time to grab a remote. And then I'm also going to grab my lens cloth, which I should have grabbed in the beginning. Always keep a lens cloth in your pocket, um, on your tool cart, so that you can wipe the lens for every shot. If you have a fingerprint or a speck of dust on the lens, then the lens does have a wool focus on that fingerprint or that speck of dust, and then you're gonna get a shot that's out of focus. So let's take a look here. I'm just going to uh, engage my Bluetooth remote, take a picture, make sure it's working. Okay. Now, let's grab these pieces of foam here, and you can see on the background, it's darkening the background. It's also limiting, eliminating the shadows, but now I kind of have a funny Look, so I'm gonna try taking these two pieces of foam core and arranging them in the triang triangle above the product. I still have some of the reflection in the bottle. I can see my phone in the bottle or my uh, computer in the bottle. I'm just gonna keep moving around until I've eliminated as many of those distractions as possible. And it's not always going to be possible to eliminate the distractions, um, but as best that you can. Once I've found a way to eliminate as many as I possibly can, then I might even pull something in like um, a background stand. So, you can pick a background stand for $100 at B&H 
And what it is is two tripod type stands that have a cross somewhere that go across the top, like so. This particular set is so much there. I have a crossbar from one background set and then the stands are from another. Um, this particular bar will fly open and close. But what I can do then is um, clip these, clip the foam cord to the stand. So, and then use that, angle it so that it's blocking all of the light. I'm not gonna do that right now. I just wanted to show you quickly if you can see in that little box. Right now, we're just gonna do it by hand. All right, so that looks relatively okay. So let's take a picture. Maybe. And then I'm going to just hold my finger on the label one more time and give it a little more light. I'm not gonna to worry too much that I see the line right here uh, because ultimately I'm gonna crop that out. I was more concerned about the computer screen that was reflecting on the bottle. Uh, I don't mind having that one uh, strip of light on the bottle. I don't like the two, but the one I like because it makes it look like it's three-dimensional. All right, so that is what it looks like when we're shooting with ambient light. Well, now let's say we've been shooting and we're moving into the evening and we're really losing light quickly. So I'm going to shut the blinds. So all we see is ambient or is the, or the overhead lights. And let's take a look and see what the difference is with that. Not too different, but of course I still have all of the reflections. So I'm going to take another picture so that we can evaluate everything once we've taken all of our shots. All right, now I want to use artificial lights. I'm going to stop my share for a moment. I want to show you some of the options for artificial lighting. A lot of you will have urban light. This is the type of light that most people start with. And these are fine. These are absolutely fine. The issue with the ring light is, as with a square um, LED type of light, is that it'll cause a reflection in the bottom. Now, when you have a square or a rectangular light, you can direct it so that it looks like it's a slice of light on the bottle and it's creating a, a 3D type of look. Whereas a ring light, it's quite clear what it is, it's a ring light. But let's turn it on and let's take some pictures with the ring light so we can see what type of effect that creates. I'm going to turn the overheads off and I'm going to share my screen again. It's gonna be dark in here for a second. All right, and now let's share the screen. All right. All right. So now you can see it looks very blue. Right, let's see that difference. We'll talk a little bit about color temperature slightly or in a moment, but for now, I just want to look and see what the different types of lights do to the scene. So you can see the ring light reflection in the bottle. Let's take this picture just so we have a point of reference. I'm going to hold my finger down on the label. And then once I did that, the phone did adjust the exposure and did adjust color temperature slightly. The phone will do that because it's all automatic. So that's helpful. Um, but it is frustrating when you've been shooting all day long and then you get to a situation 
where you have to use some type of artificial light and then all of your pictures have different lighting in them. Now, your customer may not understand what the disconnect is between all of the pictures that you're using on your website, um, but it's going to be jarring enough for them that they're gonna feel awkward and they could very well end up leaving your site or what also will happen is if the color temperature is incorrect on your products, it'll, it'll skew the color of the product itself. And that'll increase the chance of a return and negative reviews on your products and on your store, which you do not want. All right, so now you can see I've got the, the ring light. It's slightly above the product, pointing down at the product, but it's creating these really harsh shadows in the background. But let's take the picture again, just we have a point of reference. All right, now let's turn this light off for a second. It's gonna be dark for a moment. And I want to try out this LED light. All right. So now this is a square. Let me just my share so you can see what this looks like. All right. So this is a square, and this came, I bought this particular set of two lights. This is a GBM great video maker. This came from b &H. Um, and this is a really great light. I really like this when I'm on Zoom. Um, I will use this for product photography. I'll use it for fill light as well. I prefer it to the ring light, quite honestly. The ring light I like to use in the background if I need more light for whatever type of situation. Um, but if you have a, to make a choice between a ring light or these square lights, I would choose these LED lights. All right, so let's take a look and see what this does. Now, I do have two lights, as I mentioned, and I have them synced. So whatever I change, whatever settings I change on this particular light will also change on the other light. I'm gonna turn the lights down and I'm gonna disconnect them so that I only have the light coming from this one light. All right, so it'll be dark for a moment and then I'll share the screen again um, so that you can see what's happening to the scene. Okay. All right. All right, so here we go. You can see the reflection of the square here, but that's not super offensive, right? Oh, you can't actually see it yet because on. Uh, all right, here we go. So now I just have one light. All right, now you can see I have these strange lines happening here. Now I'm going to move my light around so you can see what that is. And what that is, is the light stand of the light itself. What's happening is that the light is bouncing off of the ceiling and then reflecting in the bottle so I can see those, um, see the stand. I can maneuver around the, the barn doors here on this light, but again, I just wanna take this shot for a point of reference, just so you can see. Most people are starting by taking their pictures like this. They're pointing the light directly at the product and then they're, they're frustrated because they're seeing these reflections and they're seeing glares in their products, particularly if they're using a shiny product. So let's just take one more light and then we'll come back and talk about how to avoid those situations. All right, so I'm gonna stop my share. So I can show you the final light I want to use. The final light I'm going to use is this, it's a GoDox continuous lighting source, also from b &H. And these are video lights, which means that they stay on all the time. When you're shooting with your iPhone, uh, something that's a continuous light is going to be your best option. I'm just gonna grab the remote and I'm gonna check and see what channel I'm on here. And 
Now I'm going to, oops, I'm going to turn that on. All right. So now I'm turning this light on. So this is called a softbox. This is a, a modifier. This is this can be put on any type of light. Um, this can also be put on a strobe. The little square LCDs that I, LEDs that I just showed you also have a very similar softbox modifier that I could add to them if I wanted to as well. Keep in mind when you add any type of modification to a light, you're softening the light, you're diffusing the light. Think of it as the sun. When you look up at the sun, the sun is a small circle to us from this perspective. And it's a very direct light. So when you're standing outside in the middle of the day under the sun, that's when you tend to see raccoon eyes because the direct light is coming down, hitting us and creating shadows. On a cloudy day, you tend to not see those raccoon types of eyes when you're outside. Uh, this is the same thing that a softbox is doing. It's kind of like a cloud in front of the sky, it's in front of the sun, it's softening the light and softening the scene. So let's share the screen so you can take a look and see how it looks in the scene. All right. No. Here we go. Now our business. All right. So again, you can see the strip of the light, but because this is a larger softbox, uh, the light is the strip is a little bit longer, which is actually a desirable effect. So you can spin the light around to change the type of strip you're getting. You can use a more narrow softbox, something called a strip light. Uh, and that'll create that, that strip right there. Again, that's an extremely desirable look. But I still see the reflection of my computer screen. And my computer screen is actually casting light right here on the side. So I'm going to pick up my remote. I'm going to reconnect my remote, remote to my phone. I'm going to pick up my phone core. I'm going to block you. You won't be able to see me for a second. Um, but I'm trying to eliminate the reflection of the computer and I'm also trying to eliminate the shadow as much as I can on the top here. I'm still seeing these shadows in the back. We're going to talk about that momentarily, but I just want to create a point of reference. All right, so now, in my opinion, this is the best type of light. If you were shooting, I want to show you one more type of light. Um, this is the best type of light I would recommend if you're shooting with an iPhone or an Android. Um, I just want to show you what I would use if I were shooting with my DSLR. The overhead is spooky in here. All right. So when you're shooting with a DSLR, then you want to use a strobe. So this is true. I have uh, a modifier called an optical spot. What's nice about this is that I can direct the light at my product. I can be very intentional. Intention. I can be very intentional about where I'm directing my light. I can direct different types of shadows or different types of shapes onto the product. I can uh, cast a shadow on the back. On the back on the background as well if I wanted to. If I were shooting with something like this on with a DSLR, I'd need what's called a remote, an air remote. These are pro photo lights. Um, these came with this air remote. Sometimes you have to buy the remotes separately, uh, but this will just slide right into the hot shoe of my camera and then I can control the output and on the different heads if I, I bought a set of two so I can control the output on either head. I can have one head that's a little brighter, one head that's a little darker. Now, these are particularly nice because of the, of the color consistency. So I know that when I'm shooting with these particular strobes, that my color temperature is going to be the same from picture to picture to picture. Unfortunately, oftentimes the less expensive types of sets 
aren't, ne aren't necessarily consistent with color. So some might look a little more blue and some might look a little more yellow. Let's talk a little bit about uh, light, the color temperature, and then we'll come back and talk about how to eliminate some of the shadows on the backdrop when you're having issues like that. Now, I'm going to put this back and I'm going to grab the square LEDs. Now, the computer, the phone, the camera will compensate for the color when I'm showing you this, uh, but you can watch and see what it looks like in the rest of the room. You can watch and see what it does to my skin tone. So, light is measured in Kelvin, that's a K. So if you go to a home improvement store and you're looking for light bulbs, you'll oftentimes see they'll say nice warm light or daylight or cloudy, cool light. A cool light is a blue light and that's 5,600 Kelvin. A warm light is down lower on the scale. So about 33, 3,400 Kelvin is a warm light. Right now I have this set to a cold light at 5,600 Kelvin. So it's a blue light. I'm going to turn the knob um, and again, the camera and zoom are going to compensate for it. So you might not necessarily see it if you're looking at the light itself. Look at the scene around me. Look at the room, look at my shirt, look at my skin tone, and then you'll see what happens. So I'm going to turn it and you can see very quickly it turned very yellow. Um, sometimes it even makes me look a little pinky or a little red. And I'm going to turn it to the right again, and then you can see now it's becoming more of a cool tone. How do you know when to use cold light or when to use warm light? That all goes back to your customer analysis. Uh, in the first session, I recommended that you take some time to sit down and create a customer profile. Write down who your customer is, what they like to do. At the same time, take a little bit of time to create a brand guide or style guide for yourself. When you take the time to do these things, in the future, when you're ready to hand the photography off either to a teammate, an employee, or a professional photographer, you'll have all of the tools that you can hand over so that that person can, 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 can continue creating imagery that's consistent with what you already have. So if you're more of a traditional type of brand, then you're probably going to want something that's a little bit warmer, a warmer light. If you're a little more of a contemporary brand, then you're going to want a colder light, for example. Now, it's really important that your light is consistent throughout your entire website. There could be potentially times, let's say you're a clothing outfitter or you're an outdoorsy type of shop and you um, sell winter coats or ski, ski gear or something like that. Now, that's going to be a little bit of a colder light because oftentimes when you're outside in the snow, uh, you'll see that the light reflecting off of the snow looks a little bit blue. As you start to hone your eye, as you're walking around outside, you'll start to see all of these colors. Uh, if you paint your house and you're looking at whites, you can see there are a whole bunch of different whites. Some whites have some more blue in them. Some whites have some more yellow in them. Um, so to go back to what I was saying is that oftentimes you'll have an umbrella color. So if your brand is a little more contemporary, for example, your umbrella color might be a little bit cooler, a little umbrella light might be a little bit cooler. Um, but maybe you have a particular product. So you're this outdoorsy ski shop, but you have a summer product that you want to sell. Now the light in the summer is going to be a little warmer. The light coming from the sun will be a little bit warmer than it is in the winter time. So that particular line of products might have a little bit of a warmer light to them. So that's okay. You might, you might have to change your light for that. However, make sure that that collection has all the same lighting as you're moving along. Also keep in mind that depending on where you are in the world, your light color, your color temperature of the natural light is going to be a little bit different than um, anywhere else. So if I'm in California, for example, my light is gonna be a little more yellow, a little warmer, whereas here on the East Coast, it's a little more blue. All right, so now let's look, go back to the scene and talk about how we can create the fix those shadows. I do see a question in the chat, so I just wanna take a look real quick. 
Uh, Roberto uh, is asking if these concepts apply to videography. I'm primarily a photographer, so I'm speaking from the perspective of, of a photographer. However, yes, in videography, yes, you definitely want to think about the light temperature. The lights that I'm going to be using in just a second, I'm going to turn these LED lights, well these as well are video lights, so you can see I'm changing the color temperature on these video lights. So yes, it definitely applies to video as well. All right, well, let's go back and share the screen. And I'm going to turn my overhead lights off again as soon as I get myself set up here. And there we go. All right, so now I'm going to bring this light source in as close as possible. I'm probably going to end up blocking myself with the light, so you won't necessarily see me in that small little square, but we're just looking at the scene right now. I want to grab my lens cloth. I want to wipe my lenses again, just to make sure. Now, I haven't touched that side of the camera, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. And I'm going to pick up my remote and put my remote in my hand so that if I'm in a position where I can't necessarily reach the um, shutter button on the phone, I can take a picture from wherever I happen to be. Uh, oftentimes, I am in a strange position because I have the light in front of me and I have a piece of phone core on the other side. So this remote is really a lifesaver. All right, so we're specifically looking at the shadows in the back, right? A couple of ways you can eliminate the shadows. The easiest way to eliminate it, and I'm not gonna do it right here because this is a freestanding pedestal sink and if I move it, it'll all come crashing down. We don't want that. So move your foreground, so that is the sink, the product, away from the background a little bit. That'll help eliminate shadows. That's also applicable when you're photographing yourself. So if you're a clothing brand and you're shooting yourself, people have a tendency to stand right against the wall. When you're right against the wall, you're gonna have those shadows behind you. So if you can, if space allows, come away from the wall a little bit and that'll eliminate the shadows. Same with your products, pull everything away from the wall, leave a little bit of space between the background and the foreground. That will help eliminate shadows. Now, another way to eliminate shadows is to change the direction of your light. I suggest when you're shooting in a room, make sure that the walls are a neutral color. So I have everything in this room painted gray. Um, you, white is great as well. But if you have a room that's darker, maybe a dark blue or green, then keep in mind that those the color on the wall is going to reflect onto your product and that's going to cast a hue and change the color temperature of your photograph as well. So try to find a space where the color is absolutely neutral. If you can't photograph in a room with neutral wall paint, then what you could do is you can build a room. You can buy gigantic pieces of foam core that are the height of a human being, and you can build a booth for yourself. You can also grab a couple of these background stands and you can hang curtains on them. So you can hang white curtains or you can hang black curtains, depending on what you're trying to do. If you need the scene to be a little bit lighter, then a white curtain will help with that. If you need to eliminate any type of light whatsoever, then a black curtain will eliminate the light. But keep in mind that black does absorb the light. So if you don't have a big light and you're just working with the ring light, then you might find yourself struggling to find enough light. So I would suggest in that situation, try a white curtain. And everything is trial and error. Try it, if it doesn't work, try something else. And grab a few when you're out shopping, grab white curtains, grab black curtains, and then try them. If they don't work, you can always return them. All right, so I'm just going to move back behind the light for a second, and I'm going to angle it up at the ceiling. And I'm going to have to turn the overhead light on just for a second because I have to change the cord here. So just give me one second. I'm just going to turn this light off, and I'm going to pull the power source out. Hitting, what's happening is it's hitting 
the bracket and I don't want to break it. So I'm just going to pull it out and then I'm going to put it back in and I'm going to turn my light back on. I'm going to grab the remote for my light, make sure that it's on the same channel as the light. I'm going to turn the overheads back off. And now that I have the light pointed up at the ceiling, let's take a picture. Let's hold our finger down. Make sure it's in focus. I'm not going to change the exposure on the phone this time because I just want to show you the difference of what the light is doing. So I'm going to take the picture. And what happens when I point the light up at the ceiling is that it's reducing the amount of light that's falling on my scene, which means that it's significantly darker. So I'm going to pump the light up. You can see what a difference that makes. And I'm going to play around with moving it closer, moving it farther. So the farther away I move it, the softer the light is, the more diffused the light is. In this particular case, I like it a little bit closer. You can see how the light on the background is more even. If you wanted to create a situation, I'm going to take this picture real quick. If you wanted to create a situation where you had a shadow on the background, what you could do is pull in a second light source. So I'm going to pull these LED lights in. I'm going to put it back on the blue light. I'm going to increase just so you can see and i'm going to point it at that flower in the background natalie while you're doing yeah. that we did have a question come in just because yeah. of the perspective it's probably hard for people to gauge distance yeah so we had a question regarding what is the light distance to the subject and is the light at a 45 degree angle yeah let me unshare so you can see what it looks like Okay, so here's the subject and here's the light. So I have the light pointed straight up at the top. You can spin this box around and see if it's gonna make a difference. So if I'm shooting vertically, I might wanna have it pointed so that it's vertical to the scene. If I were shooting horizontally, then I would wanna spin it so it's horizontally. Does that answer the question? And you can see I'm pretty close in here. Everything is very tight. I don't have a ton of space. So I'm very careful about where I place everything. And that's why it's important to have your remotes and your um, everything at, in hand when you need it. So I'll keep the chair off for a few seconds just so you can see what I'm doing with the lights. And then we'll look at the photographs together. So I lowered the light and I'm going to take a picture. And I left the light pointing at the flower in the back. So it's creating a, a shadow in the back. I can even, if I had a different type of plant, I can come in and I could put the plant right in front of the light and play around with that. Kind of shadow, so I'll do that so you can see what that looks like. If you want to create something that's a little more dramatic, I'm going to turn this light off. Uh, if you want to create something that's a little more dramatic and a little more edgy and has a little more contrast to it, then you can even take your light, it's going to come right in front of the camera here, and point it at the wall. I'm just going to change right here. Natalie, I have a question while you're setting that up. Do you pay attention? Yeah. So you have the products. Obviously, you have a, a light wall behind the products. Do you pay uh -huh. attention to shadow and fall off? Or is that not as much of a concern as how the product actually looks? Yeah, it depends on what I want the final image to be. So... Typically, I shoot extra space. I leave extra space, negative space around the product itself so that I don't have to worry too much about the fall off. Um, but if I'm coming in really tight, then I might yes worry about it when I'm, when I'm shooting. Okay, perfect. 
Thanks. So, all right. And then what I might also do is play around with my board. I'm going to take one of my Apple phone for, and then I'm going to play around with the foam core so you can see in the back, I'll show you in a second in the picture. In the back, I have a little bit of shadow here like, like Derek was asking me. So in this particular case, because it's right in the middle of the scene, I wanna open those shadows up a little bit and I'm going to just drop the foam core right next to the shadow and that's gonna open it up a little bit. So let me take this picture move everything out of the way and then we'll look at the pictures. And we had a follow-up question come in from YouTube asking, so basically with a strip box, it's better to bounce the light instead of aiming the strip box at the product, creating softer light? Well, a strip box will create a strip of light on your product. So... I typically will point the strip light right at the product because I'm using a strip light intentionally so that I can create that strip of light on the product. Um, if I were using a bigger soft box like this right here, then I might point it at the ceiling or I might point it at the wall. I might even take a light and put it on the floor and aim the light up between the foreground and the background. If I'm still seeing some of those shadows right in the middle of my scene, um, and I'll turn the light down dramatically so that it's not blowing or overexposing or making the backdrop look too bright. It all depends on the type of background you have. So this particular background in this case is extremely reflective. So when I put a light down on the floor, what happens is that it just blows it out. It just looks like it's a, a white background, no matter how much I turn the light down. Um, so if you have a, a darker type of background, then you can put that light between the foreground and the background to create uh, a little bit of dimension between the foreground and the background, a little bit of contrast between the two. But strip lights, typically, I will point right at the product because I'm looking specifically for that strip. I will angle it away when I'm trying to control the size of the strip. So if it's pointing at the product and the strip is too wide on the product, so let's say I'm shooting this particular glass bottle and the strip looks too wide, I will angle it away so that the strip looks a little more narrow. But sometimes it's dramatically angled away and sometimes it's not dramatically angled away. It all depends on the particular product and the shape of it and how the light is reflecting off of it. All right, so let's take a look. I'm gonna share one more time. And we're gonna take a look at all of our pictures together. Okay, so here's the last photograph that we took. And this particular light I had on the side slightly. So you can see it's creating a little bit of a strip effect. Uh, I would probably, in this particular case, turn the light a little bit more because I would want that strip to be a little more narrow. It feels a little too big. And uh, I didn't have the perspective completely correct on the bottle. So that's just exaggerating the fact that the perspective is incorrect. So I would make that strip a little bit smaller. I would angle it around a little bit more to make it a little bit smaller. Uh, this I was the same um, type of similar setup. Now this setup I had pointed up towards the ceiling. So you can see the background is a little bit lighter than in this particular case. And you can see that the angle of the light is also affecting the color temperature. So you can see here, the color temperature is a little more blue and the color temperature here is a little warmer. I also had a second light in the second shot right here and, the, and a second light was that square 
uh, LED light, and that was set to a cooler temperature. So I want to stop as I'm taking my photographs and take the time to look through each of these photographs before I shoot 100, uh, just to make sure that everything is on point. So if I'm looking through and I see that dramatic color difference, I want to make sure that I go back and I choose the photograph that I like the best and recreate the lighting setup so that I'm creating the light, the color temperature that I want for each photograph. And the color temperature is the same in each photograph. Um, here you can see, again, I had that second light and I was holding the plant in front of the light. So I'm intentionally creating the shadow on the background. Um, it's also a little bit cooler than this light. Uh, this light I had pointing up at the ceiling, this light I had it directly at the product. Um, here was without the second light. This was just this big light that I have behind me uh, pointed up at the ceiling. And you can see that the square on the bottle is a little bit smaller than it was when I had the light pointed at the bottle itself. Again, here, the light is pointing up at the ceiling. So you can see that creates a little bit of more of a dramatic effect between the highlights and the dark areas and the shadows as well. Um, so that can be desirable depending on what your brand is. Make sure that you've defined those parameters for your brand before you make these decisions in the camera. Create a mood board of different photographs that tell the story of your product, but also tell your brand story. And then that will inform whether or not you want to see some of these dramatic contrasty types of images, uh, the difference between the dark areas and the light areas. And so here was with the just the LED lights. So it's a little bit cooler because I had them set to cool. Uh, and then you can see here, those are still some of the LED lights. This I was playing around a little bit with the angle. So you can see each of these different setups is creating a different effect. Don't be afraid to play around with your light. Light doesn't have to be used in the obvious way. You don't have to point the light at the product or at the person. Bounce the light, bounce the light off the ceiling, bounce the light off the wall, bounce the light off a piece of foam core, play around with one light, play around with two lights. But most importantly, first and foremost, decide on your brand colors and decide on the color temperature that you want in all of the pictures. And then that will help inform how you're going to set your lights up, what you're going to bounce them off of, if you're going to bounce them at all, uh, and such and so forth. Wonderful. Now, we did have another question sneak in from Bossy. Bossy joining us for part two is there for with us awesome. for part one. Uh, awesome. do, do you use gels for your product shoots? It would be interesting to know when you decide to. Sometimes I do. Typically, I don't. Um, I use gels more for fun. Uh, most of my clients want something that's really natural and realistic looking, and they want to create aspirational lifestyle scenes of their products in use. So my clients in particular are looking to create a brand that's recognizable and that their customer can see in their own lives. So we create scenes of products in their homes, scenes of products in the environment that they're going to be using them in. So in the kitchen, in the bedroom, in, in the office, or if they're an outdoorsy type of client, um, then maybe outside if they're a, a hiking company, maybe we'll, be, uh, we'll put the product in a situation where we have either a model who's hiking, for example, or if we don't have models and they just... The, the client themselves want to be in the pictures, but they don't want to be recognized in the pictures, then maybe we'll just have a pair of hiking boots on their feet, for example, out in their environment. So my particular style is more realistic, more natural. Uh, so I don't tend to use gels as much in client work, but for fun, I will. You bring up an interesting point there, Natalie, in talking about Product photography, I, I think it was Bossy that asked um, in part one about, you know, shooting the sneaker and how creative to get oh, with yeah. it. And it brings up the the interesting point there of, you know, when you think of product photography, everybody thinks of it differently. Some people think of when I think of product photography, I think of, OK, you have to have the color matched exactly right. You have to calibrate your monitor because it's going to a brand and a lot of brands have very particular 
color coding, you know, they'll have a, a particular Pantone number that their, their logo is, and they have style guides that have to adhere to that. So yes. you have that side of product photography that is very rigid, very strict. If the color's off, you'll get an email from the creative director or somebody from the company who says this color's off, got to redo it. Um, and then you have the more creative side. So for those of you who are out there and you want to get more creative, that's the beauty of photography. If you don't, you know, not everybody's going to have the same style. Obviously, Natalie has her style and, and Natalie, you do what works best for your clientele. And if you, yeah. I'm sure if you get a client that wants a more creative approach, that's when you start experimenting. But it just brings up that that interesting dynamic behind product photography is there's not one brand of, of product photography. And a lot of these things that you're going over are, are building blocks and they're it's the information that you can take and you then use it and expand upon it in more creative ways if you wanted to do something that's a different style. Yeah, absolutely. It all comes back to the style guide for the brand itself and then the customer profile as well. Oftentimes, when I'm going to a customer, or a customer comes to me, I should say, they'll come to me after having worked with another photographer. And the other photographer has created scenes that I, as a photographer, think are really cool because they have different props and maybe they have um, wooden blocks with geometrical shapes and they have dramatic shadows on the background. I think that's really cool as a photographer, but my client is coming to me because they're not really sure what that means, what the story is behind it. It's a little too cool for the client, if that makes sense. Um, the client will come to me and say, well, what does this mean? Like, this isn't telling my customer what the product is, how they're going to use it, it's justifying their decision. Um, it makes it feel a little bit out of reach for my particular clientele. So it's important that you understand who your clientele is and that you're both on the same page because your style might not necessarily match their style. Uh, or you just can't create what it is that they have in mind. So the communication ahead of time is crucial. We talked a little bit about this in the first session as well. I would create a mood board ahead of time, make sure that your client, if you're a professional photographer, or if you're an independent brand and you're doing your own photography, create a mood board ahead of time so that you know exactly, if you're shooting for yourself, you know exactly what you wanna get out of the entire situation. If you're shooting for a client, you can communicate with the client and make sure that you're both on the same page. They're happy with what you foresee for the uh, final products and you're on the same page. Yeah, communication, you cannot overstate that. It is such an important thing. Bossy had followed up with uh, that part of product photography actually scares me, Derek. I'm guessing he was referring to the making sure the the colors are matched. And I'll tell you this, you're not alone. <laughs> There's yeah. a lot of people out there that are very scared by the prospect of, you know, having to have every color matched. And and look, I'm one of them. I'm one of them. I, I always look at colors and I'm like, am I, what if my eyes are off or if I'm not seeing it right? doesn't matter if you're looking at a calibrated monitor, <laughs> if this, if this isn't calibrated up here. So it's, it's intimidating. Yeah, and oftentimes the, if your monitor is calibrated, but you are in a room that has light coming from the outside or light reflecting off the walls, then that calibration will be meaningless. I, when I worked at National in the lab at National Geographic years and years and years ago, uh, we had a box created for the cal for the monitor so that you went inside of the box and you were able to look at the colors within the box and make sure that everything was on point um, with the black around you. So nothing was reflecting from the ambient environment. Yeah, it's it's interesting whenever you talk color correction, all that, especially in photography now, there's so many presets and filters and color grading and everybody wants this stylized look so it's an in interesting topic but natalie this was this was great we got one more and uh we are definitely looking forward to it i want to thank you again for coming back and sharing your product photography expertise with us and of course to all of our viewers out there thank you for tuning in as well if you guys do have any questions natalie let us know where we can find you online 
Yeah, absolutely. You can follow me on Instagram at natalie.napoleon. Uh, if you are an independent retailer and you're interested in learning a little bit more about taking photographs of your products yourself, I actually have a course that's starting tomorrow. So today is the last day to take advantage of that. We'll talk about how to create your own style guide. We'll create mood boards. We'll plan shoots. We'll actually go into a shoot. I'll go a little more into detail about lighting and using the phone to photograph your products. If you have a DSLR, we'll also talk a little bit about that. Um, so it's expanding on what we've been doing throughout this series. The last session of this particular series is digital asset management. Uh, oftentimes, we have so many files, we don't know how to manage all of them. And it can feel overwhelming, um, particularly if you're not a professional photographer. Uh, so we'll go into a little bit of that as well. Wonderful. Or you can Every find me on my website, natalienapoleon.com. There you go. Google Natalie and Napoleon. I'm going to guess there's not too many Natalie and Napoleons out there. You have to worry about picking the wrong one, right? Well, there have been some that have creeped up over the years. There used to only be one other one, but now there's a few more. But uh, you're becoming Napoleon popular. Oh, and I think it's it's <laughs> it's a good name. So <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I lucked out. <laughs> <laughs> well, make sure you guys go check that out. And look, there's a great market. We talked about this uh, in the first week. There's a great market for pro for product photography, even if you're not using it just for selling stuff online. There's a lot of money to be had out there in the commercial market for, for uh, e-com. So definitely check that out. We will see you back for part three. So you guys make sure you come check that out. And if you haven't caught up or you caught up late, you can check out parts one and now parts two on Facebook at BH Event Space backslash videos on Facebook. And Natalie, that's all we got for today. We'll see you back for part three. A huge thank you again to you for sharing your time with us. That thank is you it. for having me. It's an honor. Uh, wonderful, wonderful to have you. So we'll all look forward to next time. A huge thank you again to all of our viewers for joining us, but that's it. Another round of 